This is, uh, I'm excited about this tonight, talking about the geometry of chords. Uh, so uh, it's cool to see Jack, you on, and Luke Roberts, you're on, and Abracadab, Abra, actually, I'm probably reading that, Arcad A3, Buenos Noches. It's good to see you on. Uh, we are going to geek out about something that is really essential to music, which is chords, and even deeper than that, the geometry of chords. So uh, as always, let me know where you're coming from, and if you're part of the replay crew, uh, please say hello as well. So chords, chords are as about as about as basic as you can get with music theory, and yet there's a lot that's unknown about chords. Uh, I think a lot of musicians uh, memorize a lot of chords, learn how to play a lot of chords, but they don't necessarily understand those chords. So uh, being the clever theorist that you are, we're here to geek out about how chords really work at the atomic level to see what, what they're all about. And once you understand this, once you see this geometry of chords, you can't unsee it. And it really informs how you can play any chord in any key, whether it's a basic triad, like a major or minor chord, or extended chord, seventh chords, extended chords, and all of that. So we're going to, we're going to dive right in. And, uh, First, the question is, when I say geometry of chords, uh, you know, especially if you play the guitar, it is, it can sound confusing. Like, what is the geometry of chords? So, for example, if we look at, this is, this represents a fretboard. So, if we have here, let's say this is, you know, the headstock up here. This is the body of the guitar. And, you know, this is the, the nut. And this is, you know, your hand rises up. The fretboard to play you can find different patterns on on the fretboard and they kind of look geometric for example this is a c major scale so to play it we have uh you know c d e f g a b c you know and then you can play an octave higher you know c d e f g a b c so i just played this octave and this octave and roughly speaking, you could say that's geometric. These are shapes on the fretboard, but that's not what I'm talking about. And these are scales anyway. So what does it mean when we say the geometry of chords? Well, we're going to actually move past the, uh, the fretboard. But just as another example, I guess, as far as shapes on the fretboard, you could say that the caged chords that I talk about in other videos are kind of geometric looking. Um, so you have different shapes like the open C, but you can play C in an A shape, or you can play C in a, in a G shape, or C in an E shape, and so on. That's still not what I'm talking about. So there's an even deeper geometry based on symmetrical patterns within music, and we're going to have to move past the fretboard for now and get out our theoretical microscope and look at music within pitch space, which is a cyclical formation. And the cyclical formation, of course, applies to the fretboard because every string on the fretboard is a chromatic scale or the piano keyboard itself is a chromatic scale. It's just a linear chromatic scale. Uh, but we're going to look at pitch space, pure a pure look at the 12 notes of music. And within this pattern, there are inherent symmetries that will then inform the geometry of chords. So looking at the key of C, for example, let me throw myself on there. Looking at the key of C, uh, where C is one, we have this C note right here, the red square. And we've just aligned all of the scale degrees so that they the one aligns with C because it's the tonic in this case. And around C, all of the different intervals fan out in, in a, symmetri a symmetrical uh, mirror image or a reflect reflective symmetry around this line of symmetry between C1 and its tonic, in this case, G flat, which is the flat five, interval flat five. So already you can see that there's this inherent uh, symmetry in music and 
this symmetry is going to inform the geometry that we're going to use to pick apart chords. We're going to start with basic chords like triads, three note chords. But the cool thing is the symmetry extends through all extended chords as well. So let's look a little further. So if we take, so right now, this is like in the key of C, we're looking at all of the symmetrical intervals as they fan out or flank C on either side. And you can see how, for example, uh, F and G are equidistant from C, A flat and E are equidistant from C, as are A and E flat, B flat and D, and B and D flat. Each respective pair of notes is equidistant or symmetrical around C. Another way to look at this, to, to break it apart, to dissect it a little bit so you can take, one, take in each one on its own, this is just, you can see I'm fading out the other intervals. So you can see how in this example, B and D flat are equidistant or flanking C on either side. Now we're focusing on the key of C just because that's a common key to look at. But if we were to rotate this outer ring of scale degrees in 30 degree increments, you can actually align the scale degrees or intervals with any key and the same principles apply, the same symmetries uh, apply no matter what key you're in. Okay, so this is C where we have, again, C is flanked on either side at whole step intervals by B flat, or in this case, flat seven and D scale degree two. And you can see here that the alternating squares and circles highlight the whole steps and half steps. Let me get the, that line a little bit thinner it's a little crazy. It's a little bit better. So we have uh, squares. So you can see how flat seven and two are whole steps away from one. And then six and flat three are not whole steps. They're actually a whole step and a half step. That's why they're circles. And those are equally around the tonic one. And going to the next pair of intervals that are symmetrically flanking either side of the tonic. We have uh, the flat six, in this case, A flat and three uh, E around C. And because that's th those are part of the one set of whole step intervals, all of the squares, you can see how they are part of that set. And then you have uh, F and G or intervals four and five respectively, which are part of the set of circles that are their own set of whole steps around C. And then uh, lastly, we have C and its tritone G flat, or in any key that's interval one, the tonic and its tritone flat five. So all together, taken together, these six symmetries are constituent interval sets within the key of C or again, any key. So instead of just saying again, any key, just understand I could finish every sentence like that, or again, any key. <laughs> All right, so I'll stop saying it, but you know, that's what I mean. So uh, speaking of, you could rotate these numbers to highlight any key. This is what we were just looking at in the key of C. C is one. If we rotate the uh, numbers, all of the letters are still in place, but if we rotate all of the numbers, the uh, relative nature of, of scale degrees now highlights D flat as one. So D flat is the one. But again, those same symmetries are, they exist within this key. And then D, now we've rotated the numbers one more increment over. So D is one or the tonic. Same symmetry, same, same symmetries are there. Kind of hard to say. And all of the keys show these relationships. Uh, all 12 keys because in pitch space and just in music, the 12 notes of music are cyclical and symmetrical, which is important. That's why once you learn these patterns in one key, they apply to all 12 keys. Okay, I said I would stop saying that, <laughs> but it was worth mentioning again. So because these same patterns apply in all 12 keys, if we were to take this like, you know, fanned out pattern, and combine it with this fanned out pattern, 
and combine it like transparent overlays, combine it with this fanned out pattern of, of symmetries and so on. If we combine all of those together, we get this, uh, do I have an image of it? We have this like super pattern or this, uh, you can kind of see it actually in these images. It's faded out behind all of the, all of the intervals, but it's this like intricate web of intervals, which is perfectly symmetrical that basically is a combination of all those, all of those respective intervals in each respective key, but combined into this, like I say, the super pattern. So now that we have this super pattern, we can uh, split that out into the respective um, the respective patterns within all keys. And what we get is six fundamental geometric patterns. Separating each tritone uh, are a sharp four and flat five. So uh, from a tonic. So let's say when C was the tonic and B flat was its tritone, in color, we call those complementary colors, in this case, C and red. In music, we call that tritones, but they're just two phrases for the same thing. Likewise, we could say D and A flat are tritones. If D was one, A flat would be its tritone, flat five. Or in reverse, if A flat was one, then D would be its tritone, flat five, because it's, it's like Superman and Bizarro Superman. They're like, polar opposites of each other. And the same applies for every set of tritones or every set of complementary colors in music. Same ideas apply to four and five. C is across from its respective subdominant and dominant, or in this case, four and five, F and G. Likewise, D is across from its four and five, uh, G and A, and so on. Those patterns are symmetrical across all 12 keys as are intervals of three and flat six, which form perfect triangles. Uh, and that's going to come into play in one of the chords uh, we play coming up. Flat three and six are perfect squares. And I'm just highlighting one set, but because there are 12 notes and each of these squares has four points, that means there are three squares. And that's another chord that we're going to play coming up. And then also two and flat seven, basically form a hexagon of whole step intervals or with the squares and circles, that's one set of squares and then alternating uh, circles is the other set of major seconds in, in flat sevenths. And then lastly, we have flat seven or sorry, flat two and seven, which are just half step intervals, which is another name for the chromatic scale. So the chromatic scale uh, in nerd speak, you could refer to that as a dodecagon <laughs> in geometric speak but it's basically just a chromatic scale separated with all the notes separated by half steps. Okay, so in total, we have six fundamental geometric patterns and these geometric patterns are at play in every chord that you play. Uh, every chord is, takes pieces of these different uh, geometries, these different symmetries and you come up with different harmonies, different qualities of chords that reflect those underlying geometric patterns. So for example, uh, to play a chord, um, we have basically each chord or each pattern is a subset of the last. So if we start with the chromatic scale, the 12 notes of music. So for example, I'm gonna play the chromatic scale, uh, starting with C is one. So a C is one. Okay, that's the chromatic scale. It doesn't sound very musical on its own. So if we take a subset of that pattern, C is still one, and we throw in some half step and whole step intervals, we get the C major scale. It has a little more movement and direction where C is clearly the home base or the tonic. It's the point of resolution. We could rise up through C, uh, moving in a clockwise direction, or we could descend going in a counterclockwise direction. Okay, that's the C major scale. And then and the C major scale is a subset of the chromatic scale because we're only taking some of the notes and, and throwing out others. Then each chord is a subset of 
that scale. In, in the key of C, for example, we have C, uh, which is one, E, which is three, and G, which is five. So instead of, we just play three of the notes. And we have a C major chord, which is a subset of a subset. So that's how all of these patterns are nestled together because there's this, there's this inherent connection due to the intervals that uh, connect all of the notes. Okay, so that's how we formed one of these patterns. And we're getting to the geometry here in a second. You can kind of see it, start of it with these lines here in this chord, but we're gonna explain that a little further. Well, a lot further. So we could take that same, we're still looking at pitch space, which is a helpful way of looking at notes because music is cyclical and symmetrical. So this is just summarizing what we just looked at. The C major chord, we have this basic pattern of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then back to one, which is the C major scale. And if we start on one and skip every other note and combine them, we have C, E, and G, or a C major chord. If we go to the D minor chord, we start on scale degree two and skip every other note. Those aren't ones, those are just lines. Let me just do a dot, dot, dot. Then we start on D, F, and A. We have a D minor chord. And just for one more, start on the third scale degree, E, G, and B. We're just taking every other note of the underlying C major scale. We have an E minor chord and so on. So all of these seven chords are formed using the same basic formula, the same basic idea, and they all form these triangles. Now, to say triangle kind of sounds like geometry, and it is. I mean, these, these connections between chords are triangles, but that's still not what I'm getting at when I say geometry. Actually, we're gonna see these underlying symmetries, those ge six geometric patterns show up in these chords. So by that, let's look at this a little bit further. And you can see that by combining every other note from the underlying pattern, the underlying major scale, we get this interesting pattern that happens, which is we get a major third and a minor third for, um, for this major chord, for C major. For D minor, the, the interval pattern is a minor third followed by a major third. So it's just reversed. Instead of major and then minor, like in the major chord, we have minor and then major in the minor chord. Other minor chord also is a minor third followed by a major third. So we have uh, E minor to G is a minor third, and then to B from G to B is a major third. And from F major, starting on F major, going to A and then A to C, it's a first an interval of a major third, and then from A to C is a minor third. So combined, we have an F major chord and so on. So all of the major chords begin with a major third. So C major has a major third first, F major has a major third first, first meaning the first interval in that chord combination, uh, or interval combination. And then we have in G major, it's a major third as the first interval. Let me get rid of some of my lines here so it's a little easier. It's not so scribbly. So just to show that again, uh, the major chord C major has a major third as it's the first interval in that pattern. F major, the, uh, the next major chord, see how there's a major, major. G major has a major third. So C, F, and G, they're all kind of buoyant happy sounding chords because they're major chords. They're major chords because the first interval in each of those is a major. Um, and then all of the minor chords begin with a minor third, minor third, minor third, uh, A minor has a minor third, and then B diminished also has a minor third. So all of the other chords in this key, D minor, E minor, A minor, and then also B diminished, they all have a minor third, okay? So that's why they have more of a, a sadder or melancholy sound to use rough terms. Um, so what's interesting is the major thirds and minor thirds. The three is the major third and the minor third, another way of referring to that is a flat three. So 
in uh, in the C major chord, for example, it goes from C to E. So it's a major third. In the F major chord, it's an F to A, so it's a major third. And in the G major chord, it's a G to B, so it's a major third. So a major third or segments of this triangle pattern are inherent to music and specifically to major chords. Then you have this interval of a flat third or a minor third, which is inherent to other chords. So for example, the D minor chord, the first interval is from D to F. And then also in the E minor chord, it's from E to G. The A minor chord goes from A to C as that first interval of that triad. And then from B to D in the B diminished triad. So you can see that in the minor and diminished chords, this flat third comes into play. But what's interesting is when we go back to these chords, the major chord, for example, C major, the first interval is a major third, but the second interval is a minor third. So now it's a minor third is the second interval. Likewise, in the F major chord, minor third is the second interval. G major, a minor third is the, is the second interval. And then in the minor chords, like D minor, we have D to F is a minor third, but then that second interval is a major third. It's the same with the E minor chord. The second interval is a major third. Same with an A minor, or sorry, that's an F major chord. Uh, and same with the uh, the A minor chord, it's from it's a major third from C to E. So I'm going to show what I want to show. There we go. So major third, minor thirds, and major thirds. Okay. So uh, if we show in C major, so the first interval is a, a a major third, but then the second interval from E to G is right there, it's a minor third. And from in F major, the first interval is right here, it's F to A, the second interval is A to C. So you can see it's the same intervals, it's major thirds and minor thirds. They're, they're showing up in all of these chords. Also what's cool is if we go back to these and we look at this last interval, so let's, let's look at C major again. We have a major third from C to E, a minor third from E to G, and then we have this big old stretch, relatively big old stretch, from G to C. Um, now, going in this direction, it's a fourth. From G to C is a perfect fourth. But um, so far, every move that we've been doing has been going in a clockwise direction. So we have a major third from C to E, a minor third from E to G. And if we combine those from C to G, this, this interval, is a perfect fifth. Oh, didn't mean to erase that. Is a perfect fifth. Likewise, from A, or sorry, from D to A, it's a perfect fifth. And from E to B, it's a perfect fifth. Why is that not letting me draw it? There we go. And then from F to C is a perfect fifth. In other words, every chord has a perfect fifth, <laughs> except for the diminished chord, which has a diminished fifth. So, that shows that C to G, this interval shows up in the C major chord. In the F major chord, we have uh, from F to C. And in the G major chord, we have from G to D, those are fifths. So those intervals show up in the, all of these triads. And in the A minor chord, we have from A to E, in the D minor or E minor chord, we have from E to B. And in the D minor chord, we have from D to A. So these patterns of the six symmetries, these in particular are like the fundamental patterns of harmony, at least in triads. Triads are just three note chords like C, E, and G. A triad, like a tricycle or a tripod, tri just means three. So a triad in this case is our three note chords. So these patterns, all of the, uh, the star shape of fourths and fifths, these triangles of major thirds and also flat sixths, and then these squares of flat threes and six, those are all like the fundamental inherent geometries at play in triads. Now triads are important uh, and they're, they're really fundamental because it's like all the major, major and minor chords in music and also the diminished chord. But there are other chords. 
uh, and these geometries, these other ones, start showing up as well, which we're going to look at here in a second. So uh, those are the inherent symmetries and geometries at play in most chords that we play. Here's a breakdown of what we just looked at using the C major chord as an example, C, E, and G. Okay, so there's this fifth, this thin line that shows up in the chord right here. There's this major third, this thick black line that is highlighting that interval. And then there's this minor third between E and G, uh, which shows up there. So you can see how the G major chord, or sorry, the C major chord, for example, which again is a subset or just a selection of notes from the C major scale. Those three intervals come from are echoing or are an inherent implicit reference to these underlying geometries. And because these geometries are symmetrical across all 12 keys, that uh, informs every chord in all 12 keys. Uh, so again, we keep using C major as the example just for reference as simplicity. I mean, if I tried to do, do this for every chord in music, we'd be here all night and week. Uh, but you get the idea, right? These are these are fundamental to music. Okay, so that those are triads, and again, these these geometric patterns are fundamental to triads, major chords, minor chords, and diminished chords. But if we look at some of these note patterns just on their own, you can come up with some chords. For example. The C augmented chord is straight up just a pure triangle. It's, it's made up of a major third, a major third, and a major third. So instead of a, having a G right here, which would force this to be a minor third and this to be a perfect fifth, instead, we're just playing all major thirds. So C, E, and G sharp. And it has this kind of dissonant sound. There's a theoretical use of augmented chords, and we can talk about that another time. But just an augmented chord itself is straight up geometry. And this, this triangle pattern comes from that subset of geometric symmetries, which is part of the major third and flat sixth pattern. Also, we could play a C diminished chord, which is a C flat three, flat five, and double flat seven. And together those form a square, which is directly from the flat three, six pattern. Uh, double flat seven is an enharmonic name for the interval of six. Uh, and it's called a double flat seven uh, because the, the formula of intervals that are used, and we can talk about that another time, but basically it's uh, a minor third, minor third, minor third, and a minor third sounds nice. And we could rotate this square in 30 degree increments to come up with uh, three different three different chords that are similar. So we have uh, this chord, and then we also have, uh, let's see, sorry, let me, I've got to turn to it. Let's, let's actually pull up this camera. Okay. So we have minor thirds. Okay. And then we have another square of minor thirds, square referring to cyclical pitch space. And then we have another triangle of, actually I skipped one. Then we have a minor third triangle, or a minor third square, pardon me. And then the other one that I just played. And then we just repeat ourselves as we go up higher because they're, they're just inharmonic names for the same chords as we go. So this is, uh, this is a geometric pattern, but let's start getting into uh, looking at the geometries that are at play in the different chords, starting again with C major. So C major, as we've already explored, is made of its subsets or its intervals come from three patterns. The, uh, the fourths and fifths, specifically the fifths, the major third, and the, the minor third. Uh, those form this triangle right here. If we look at, say, a C minor chord, 
So C is still one, but now we have a minor third and a major third. We still have that fifth there. So it's still the same geometries of uh, this star, this star, and this star, or geometric symmetries. And if we go on, well, let's play those. So C major, C minor, those two triads. Now, as we start getting into seventh chords and extended chords, we start to reach into these other geometric, geometric symmetries. So, so far we've with the triads, we've just been sticking with these, these standard patterns, but we start getting into some more dissonant territory as we reach into higher chords. So, for example, we have a C to E is a major third. So that shows up right here. And then we have E to G is a minor third. So that comes from this pattern. And then we have a G to, um, well, we're going to actually highlight this. So it's a G to a C, which is part of the, the five. Oh, I circled the wrong one first. Let me, let me start over because that's important. So C to E is a, ma is a major third. So that actually is this pattern. And then E to G is a minor third. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So it's uh, this part of this pattern. And then uh, G to C is uh, this pattern. And then C to a B, or just going a whole step back, is part of this set of hexagons. And then we also have the connection between B flat and E. That's partly why a seven chord, in this case, C, E, G, and B flat. This uh, C, E, G, and B flat. This E and B flat are tritones. They're polar opposites, yellow and purple. Um, those two notes are part of a set of tritones. So if we look at it in this formation, it comes from this pattern. So in a seven chord, in this case, a C seven chord, a C flat seven, we have these geometries that are at play. And you can hear that there's more dissonance because there's more activity going on. It's not just staying within the relative, relatively consonant and basic geometries that are at play in most triads. We're reaching into because we add one more note, a fourth note to that combination, we therefore get more dissonance and more geometry going on. Now, as we go to a ninth chord, we're still playing with the same, the same basic geometric patterns, but uh, the chord sounds different because again, we added now a fifth note. So C to E is a major third and E to G is a minor third. G to C is part of the five. Uh, it's really C to G is the fifth. And then we have this tritone of B flat to E. So that's showing up here. We have this C to B flat, a whole step back in the hexagon. So in a counterclockwise direction, but then from C to, to D or the nine, it's part of that hexagon as well. So that's why the hexagon still shows up because D is a whole step above C, whereas B flat is a whole step below C. And because both are part of that hexagon pattern, that's why they're both there. But let's play this chord so you can hear it. So now we're playing a C9 chord. So it's C, E, G, B flat, and D. And it's called a nine. We talked about this in other videos, but basically this is a nine chord because in the scale we have C, D, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight. The octave of the tonic of one is eight. And then if we continue on, what was two in the lower octave is now a nine in the upper octave. What was three is a 10. What was four is an 11, because we just go eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and then 15. 15, eight, and one are just different octaves of the tonic. So anyway, that's why we play, we call it a one, three, five, flat seven, and nine chord because that nine is, it's a compound interval. It's the octave above the tonic. Okay, so let's go back to our geometries here. Now we're gonna play an 11 chord and each of these chords, just so you can see the pattern, to play a C triad, C major triad is just every other note. And then we played, we added a flat seven, flat 
seven is not part of the C major scale, but it sounds so much better than a major seven, but it's more common. And then we continue that every other pattern um, to play. We could have played the B, but instead of skipping C, we're skipping two notes in that case. Two, a nine, and then one, three, five, flat seven, nine, and 11. It's a C11 chord. Now we're starting to get into like jazzy type territory because it's such dissonant and rich sounding chords. But uh, the richness comes from the underlying geometries. So to break this apart, we have C to E is part of the major thirds. E to G is part of the uh, minor thirds. That C to G going around, around as, a, as a five. And then the flat seven is part of a hexagon. The nine is part of that same hexagon. That to C is part of the tritones. And now we have uh, the this connection right here, this half step interval, the semitone, which is part of a dodecagon, which is a in this case a flat uh, a flat two above E. Also, C is uh, related to the F by way of this pattern because it's a four and E to F is part of the minor third. <laughs> so we're starting to like have, again, as we add each new note to the mix, we're getting way more harmonic relationships. Just like in a family, if, if you know, someone is dating and they're like, hey, I want to bring my boyfriend over for Christmas, like that new person adds another dynamic. And now it's not just one new person, it's all of the relationships between the people in that scenario. It's like that with chords, uh, where each new note you add to the group adds another dynamic and much more harmonic complexity, just like the relationships in a family. And then the last, uh, the last chord is a 13. So you kind of get the idea. We just keep adding more and more notes. C, E, G, B flat, D, stretch my hands, B, uh, D, F, and A. And now we're fully in the realm of all of these geometric patterns. Okay, so let me just wrap up the last couple of points then I wanna to speak to some of the comments here. So the idea is, so we could have, and in, uh, in part five of the course, I get into all of these patterns, not only as geometries within pitch space, which is helpful because it's cyclical and easier to wrap your head around the cyclical nature and the symmetries of these patterns, but to see these on the fretboard is, like next level, because then you can like navigate the instrument and not just have it in your head, translate it to your hands and apply all of these principles in your songwriting. So the idea though, is to not just try to see these on the guitar first, that could blow a fuse. <laughs> so it helps to, to wrap your arms around it within cyclical pitch space. And so just like Da Vinci says, it's better to dissect something from multiple views. He literally, this is from a cadaver that he was dissecting and he got a better understanding of his subject by looking at it from different angles, literally. And the same applies to music. You know, you can look at these patterns. This is an example of fifth notes where, you know, C is related to F and G within cyclical pitch space. You can look at it in a linear format like we just did on the keyboard you can see a relationship between uh, C, F, G, and uh, C. You can see those relationships in a linear format, or on a fretboard, you can start to see relationships between these notes oh, on the frets. So for example, you have you know, C, which is between C, F, and G, or C, uh, C. Oh, sorry, that's not C, it's uh, G. You have C, F, and G. So seeing these relationships helps you start to um, know how to navigate the instrument and move around. And then when you start applying different overlays of geometric patterns, suddenly you go from, oh, I should just memorize where to place my finger. You start to note your finger is informed. It's like your finger has, has its own mind because it understands theory. Uh, and knows why it's going, where it's going. Uh, and so this is like, like Da Vinci says, to look at things from multiple perspectives, whether it's cyclical pitch space 
within a linear format board uh, or on a fretboard. And once you have this mental composite of images, including not only the layout, but also the underlying symmetries that inform that layout, then you can really, you're cooking with oil at that point. Uh, so that, that is a high level look of the geometry of chords. And I want to uh, jump into some, some of the comments here, uh, which I will do right now. Uh, let's see. So jumping through, um, uh, Faust Esquire, thanks for sharing. Thanks for being here. Uh, hopefully this makes sense and gives some, uh, some context or some background, some meaning behind chords. We all know that chords sound good, but why do they sound good? Much of it is because of these geometric patterns. Okay. So let me go to, um, Der Adler, Quoltz, good to see you on. Thanks for being here. Um, uh, you said, I've learned more from you in a week than I have in several years. That's very cool. Yeah, it's uh, once you can see music theory, which is uh, by definition what music theory is, is to see sound. Once you can actually see it, uh, you can't unsee it, and it really helps speed up the learning process. That's what I found. I, I spent so much time, and by that I mean years and years and years, first avoiding theory because I thought it was going to be a pain because I thought music notation was the only lens through which to understand theory. And then once I learned that it's actually just a bunch of geometry, and by that I mean just like simple geometric shapes and patterns and relationships, it just opens everything up. So I'm so glad you're here and I'm, I love to hear that. And I'm so excited for everything you're discovering because there's good stuff in music theory. Uh, Kishan, you said, I've following your that's why I'm here from Bangalore, India, early morning. Right on. Well, good morning to you. I'm so glad you're here. And thanks for, for being here, geeking out with us on music theory. Ultimately, the whole point is to apply these concepts to songwriting, uh, although music theory itself is, is super interesting in and of itself. Um, very cool, Luke. I'm glad this is, uh, this is fun to see. Uh, the fact that music is geometry. I mean, we all can hear these patterns and they make sense. They're consonant, sometimes dissonant, but they're, they always resonate. And why is that? It's because there's a method to the madness. There's this underlying structure that is informing these patterns that we hear. Uh, and so to be able to unlock theory by seeing these patterns, it is a lot of fun. Um, Kishan, you said, just wanted to know uh, if I subscribed to your channel, would all of these training videos be available there? Um, want to order your stickers, uh, but then need to know how to use them, right? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, all of these videos, like this live stream and all of the videos I have on YouTube are just on YouTube. And they're, for the most part, organized into playlists. But if you mean like on mycolormusic.com, uh, on Locals, I have a supporter site and library that has lots of materials that are organized within context with diagrams that support all this. So for example, I'm going through these diagrams right here and just kind of, you know, rolling through the diagrams, explaining them. But in the library, these diagrams are categorized by post. So you can take them in at your own pace and, and actually put theory to practice. So with the labels, that's the idea of the library is to have specific application for all of these ideas and, you know, actual diagrams to, to play with. There's also a full music theory course there. So it's a 20 lesson course, five part course. And I'm currently working on lesson 16, lesson 15, uh, just was published a couple of weeks ago now. And that starts at square one. It starts with no expectation of any prior knowledge and starts with notes and intervals, how they work, and then each concept builds on the last through scales, through chords, through progressions, through song structure, through all of these patterns on the fretboard. So um, hopefully that answers your question. There's a lot of material there and uh, you can take it in at your pace. Um, and Virtuous Heretic, yes. So thank you for, for that uh, comment and that, yeah, that's, something to check out if you're interested uh, to take in those materials there. Um, all right, so, and, oh yeah, okay, so to Virtuous Heretic's point, like much of my time on YouTube, so 
you may have noticed I've had more produced videos on like animated and, and pretty diagrams and stuff on YouTube. Uh, and right now I'm doing the, the weekly uh, live streams here, which is a lot of fun because it's just like, instead of just getting all uh, into the minutia of animations and stuff, just to kind of like connect with you and talk through music theory. Um, so I'm doing live streams, which is less time on produced videos, which I'm going to be getting back to on YouTube. Um, but to Virtuous Heretic's point, like so much of my juice, so much of the, the energy is going into just pushing through and getting the full course done. So lesson 16, I have to say, speaking of that is by far, I think, in my opinion, the coolest lesson so far. That's the first lesson in part five, um, getting into the fretboard matrix and all sorts of stuff that I haven't shared before, even on locals or here. Um, so it's it's going to be fun to uh, get that one out. And then everything that builds on that is going to be a lot of fun. So anyway, uh, as that rolls out, uh, there's uh, the floodgates open in terms of all, all of that. Um, all right. So Alapico, it's very cool to see you on. Thanks for joining and geeking out with us on the Geometry of Chords. Um, all right. So, uh, yes. So, Virtuous Heretic, I love your comment. And that I'm going to talk about that in one of the behind the scenes, too, within Locals. is just the, the method. I've been asked there about what's the process. And it is, uh, I want to say literally backbreaking. I haven't literally broken my back, but it is a lot of bending over <laughs> and organizing notes. And uh, it's it's fun and grueling all at the same time to put together these materials. Um, but it's worth it because music theory is amazing, music is amazing, and it's beautiful stuff. Um, Linder2, watching this on my smart TV, feeling like I'm in a virtual class, this stuff is kind of boggling my mind. That's so cool. Um, I wonder what it looks like on your uh, smart TV. That's so cool. And uh, it boggles my mind too. I remember when I was first getting into just understanding the the layout of notes on the fretboard. Um, back in the day, I did it first with, uh, like it was before I got into uh, computer apps and doing animated images within a computer. It's a long way of saying before I used a computer and it was all by hand. So that was where a lot of the backbreaking stuff happened because I was over a light table with scissors and color paper and, and double-sided tape and all this stuff. and I remember plotting out and seeing the pattern of notes on the fretboard for the first time. And it was boggling my mind too, to use your phrase. Uh, I was laughing out loud, kind of maniacally <laughs> when, when these patterns first jumped out. Cause they are, it's, it's amazing. They're beautiful. Um, Tobias, um, just chance upon this. I'm so lucky. Um, well, very cool. Thanks for your feedback on the music teaching and uh, it's, it's music theory. It's like, it's hiding in plain sight. And for the longest time, I was so frustrated. It was this existential dilemma that I could hear music in my head. I wanted to play music. I had these songs that I wanted to like usher forth. And, uh, and then once you get into music theory, whether it's tablature or diagrams, traditional black and white diagrams or music notation, it's more than a buzzkill. It is an existential threat to your creative spirit. Uh, and so to actually be able to see these patterns and to soak it in and make sense of them to in turn apply these ideas to creation, to the creative uh, spirit is, is what it's all about. So I wax philosophical, but thank you Tobias for your, for your feedback. I'm so glad you're here. Linder tube. Um, I argued that triads are triads because the notes are separated by thirds. Uh, because a sus two slash four chord, like a sus two or a sus four chord, aren't considered triads. Uh, the chord is suspended. Um, oh, please, because it uh, isn't hasn't ha doesn't have a resolved third. Okay, so Linder tube, you make a good point. So let's look at uh, this triad. Is that is it easier to hear the higher pitch, or is that kind of like grating on the microphone? I'll go with the lower one. Um, so you have C, E, and G major third right here and a minor third right there. So it's a triad. The number three definitely comes into play in music theory because you have a triad, tri meaning three, 
Also, tertian intervals. Tertian means three because it's a major third and a minor third. So three's three's the magic number here. So you have you know a major third or a major chord. You have a minor chord. But if you play a suspended two chord, for example, so or you play a suspended four chord, it's true. This this one this F wants to resolve to the to the th three. And this two wants to resolve to the one. So, uh, yeah, there, those chords you could say aren't technically triads. And so, um, the uh, so arguing that the triads uh, are triads because the notes are separated by thirds. Yeah. So the triads, the tertian triad, that three definitely is a key element, and you wouldn't call this necessarily a triad, even though it has three notes. The triad, to your point, to, to fine tune the definition there, triad would refer to tertian interval chords uh, rather than, say, a suspended or a two or four. I like it. Um, okay, so Dave Mercer, uh, never heard this explained like this before. I'm learning more and more each Monday. Very cool. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I'm having more and more fun each Monday, and it's, it's fun to... Uh, go through these patterns because I mean, we're geeks, right? I mean, most musicians, they, they're just like, I want to play stairway to heaven. There's no question of, and, and I'm not knocking stairway to heaven because it's an excellent song. Actually, I want to do a live stream about that song in particular for an unusual reason, but uh, yeah, just like knowing how things work, the, the question behind the question, like why, does that sound good or how does that work is what it's all about. Uh, seeking, seeking answers tends to lead to those answers. Again, I wax philosophical on some of these comments, but I, I I'm so glad you're here. Thanks Dave. Um, very cool. Uh, uh, Iggy, I am so glad you're here and I'm glad it's making sense. Yeah. The, uh, the geometry of music is you don't expect to see it, you know, that, I mean, who, who would have thought music is like this structure, that there's this inherent, intricate, geometric, symmetrical framework? Like, what the hell? I didn't see that coming <laughs> when I first got into music theory. So the fact that it's there is, it's like beautiful. It's like Mother Nature loves us. Uh, Mother Nature is not throwing us a curveball, but is like letting us in on some beautiful secrets. Um, okay, so... Delta four making it way too complicated. So I, I, I can hear what you're saying, especially if you see a diagram, for instance, like this. So I can see how that could seem complicated because it would be so much easier to just, you know, maybe even close your eyes and play that chord and not have to think about the constituent parts to think about things at the atomic level. Um, but I would say if you really want to understand something, just like, uh, Leonardo da Vinci did, he wanted to, when he was creating his art, he got, oh, it's down here. Actually, when Leonardo da Vinci was creating his art, he could have just painted a body. He could have just painted someone like Michelangelo did where Michelangelo didn't do the dissections and Michelangelo came up with some amazing stuff like the David statue, for example, which is amazing. He also painted the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo did, which does look amazing. So he didn't s literally scratch below the surface, uh, which is kind of gross because this is a cadaver and it involves scratching below the surface or from the surface level of the skin. Da Vinci did. He got into the weeds, into the nuts and bolts or the tissues, bones, sinews and, and, uh, and nerve endings here to really understand things. And arguably uh, he is considered by many to be the greatest scientist and artist of all time. Um, so whatever, whatever's your cup of tea, if, if this is too granular for you, then that's understandable. Um, I, I lean towards wanting to know how things work, even if it does end up looking like it's seemingly complex it's actually not that complex. To be fair, I am kind of like moving through this pretty quickly. 
But if you take this in at your own pace and soak it in and see that it's actually not that complicated, uh, it, it actually makes more sense once you really soak it in. But I hear what you're saying that looking at geometric lines like this, especially as you get into extended chords, can seem like, whoa, that is arguably overwhelming, but it's really not. Okay, so let's go to, but thank you for your comment because I, I appreciate just talking through these concepts. Um, okay, so Kishin, a little too lost. And I'm guessing that is maybe as we got into the extended chords, if you stick with the triads, which most of the time, most music, most popular music anyway, is major chords, minor chords, and sometimes diminished chords, seventh chords do. Um, the, the underlying geometries are not that complicated. Now, this can seem arguably for the G whiz file, meaning what's the practical application uh, with a bunch of what you could consider to be football diagrams, you know, like, all right, you know, you pass the ball over here, you run over here. And so it seems like it's just theory, but playing these patterns, seeing that there's a relationship, this is actually a C minor chord, seeing this relationship and how these same structural intervals are rotatable or symmetric within all 12 keys. That's really the key. And I said that I would stop saying it at the start, but it really is kind of the aha moment is once you learn these patterns in one key and on one note, it unlocks it for all of them. It's like you, you learn one pattern from one position and because music is symmetrical based on these geometries, you suddenly can like shift from one position to the next. So it's beyond just playing caged chords, for example, which is just learning where to place your fingers, but informing your fingers why you're doing it and knowing why things work is, uh, knowledge is power, as they say, uh, and it, it is powerful. Um, okay, so uh, Linder Tubo, this whole presentation and research into this is impressive, uncharted territory, very cool. I'm glad it's helpful. Um, yeah, I, I had not come across these in my, in my, uh, my journey of music theory, but to see them and see that mother nature is, is consistent and predictable is very helpful. Um, Delta four. So music theory isn't that hard, but this concept is making it way more complicated than it needs to be. I'd be interested. Where you're coming from on that or, uh, what your approach is because many roads lead to Rome. And if this road isn't yours, it's totally fine. Um, all right, so Linder Tube, this is part of music theory. This, li this live is specifically about the geometry of music, which is one of my specialties. Very interesting stuff. Uh, if you have an interest in intervallic function. Yeah, intervallic function is, music is intervals. So much of the time, there's a lot of emphasis and it's easy to think of music as the notes, the sounds that you hear when really it's the intervals between those notes. And I talk about this in other videos, but it's like if you think of space as planets, then you're kind of missing much of what it's about. Like from the earth to the moon, it's the space between the gravity and the relationship between those two objects in space, the vacuum of space or the interval is really what it's about. That's what when Claude Debussy said, music is the space between the notes. I think that's what he was getting at, which is the intervals. And these intervals can be traced by geometric lines that are totally symmetrical and predictable. Once you understand that, you've basically cracked much of the code. Um, can you explain, Jack, you said, can you explain the best way to incorporate these concepts in songwriting? Yes. So these, we're, we're looking at music at a very granular level or atomic level in that we're just looking at the framework or, or construction of chords. Um, and so chords is just one layer or ingredient in a song. When you combine these chords into chord progressions, which have their own relationships that we, you know, look at, say, for example, in the circle of fifths, um, these geometries that we're talking about that are, that are baked into chords, the individual triads or extended chords also inform like, so Music, music is fractal in that these geometric relationships are at play within the individual chords themselves.
But then at the macro level, these same geometries inform and guide chord progressions. Like in the circle of fifths, you have you know, a, tri a triangle of uh, chords that you have like an augmented or sorry, you have like a major third, which is, you know, the, the dominant, uh, secondary dominant to its relative minor to D's relative minor. Like I'll, I'll need to do a video on this to really do this concept justice, but the fractal nature of music means that these geometries that inform the individual chords themselves also guides and informs the movement between the chords on a larger scale in chord progressions, which are used in songwriting. Um, so learning things at the atomic level also simultaneously informs things at the, the macro level. It's a good question and kind of a high level answer that I'll, I'll do another video on that that gives it more justice because that's a great question. Um, yes, Luke, storytelling, it's all about storytelling and having the ingredients or the language of music. Uh, music theory is like the syntax or grammar of music and uh, to understand how that language works is what allows you to tell musical stories in the form of songs. So I love it. That's, that's a good way to put it. Um, all right. So uh, we're coming up, or actually we are upon the hour. So let me just uh, hit a couple more comments and then um, we'll, um, we'll wrap it up. All right. I got way behind on comments. Um, okay. All right, let's see. Sorry, I'm just looking through the comments here. So Jed, um, ever thought about how these patterns relate to the platonic solids or sacred geometry? That's an interesting question. I do have a, a video on um, Pythagoras and the piano calendar, or yeah, I think that's what the video is called, where there's some kind of interesting questions um, about just how these patterns relate to uh, some of those things. But that's a good question. And I'd be interested to know uh, any exploration you've done on that. I haven't delved super deep into that, but there's definitely, this geometry is inherent to music. Um, all right, so let's see. Hey Rod, you said, um, do you actually hear the minor interval within the major chord? That's a good question. Um, so let's say we have C, that's a major interval. And then, yeah. I do hear, I do hear that minor interval within the major chord, and that's why a major chord isn't just, you know, the. Am I showing my keyboard? Yeah. So the five is definitely consonant because it's that interval of a perfect fifth. Those two notes are adjacent within the circle of fifths, and um, I can kind of hear it. I don't know. Can you hear that minor third? Um, I, it adds an element of, to, to use very basic terms, because English or just verbalizing these relationships and these sonic qualities is kind of fat thumbing it. It doesn't totally do the, the quality of the, the interval justice, but for lack of a better phrase, you have kind of a consonant major third or a, a brighter sound and then kind of a a relatively sad sound. I hate to say sad because it doesn't really sound sad, but, and that mix of major third and minor third gives it that quality. Um, and it's that first interval that, that especially gives the, the chord it sounds. So yeah, I can kind of hear it. I don't know if you can hear it. Uh, cool. So let's see, Donidri, uh, how much of the theory course PDFs are in the beginner book? Okay, so that's a great question. In the library, there is a beginner book. There's a beginner book, for, beginner method book for piano, guitar, and ukulele. So none of those beginner books really even delve into theory. Um, they are meant more for just getting your hands on the respective instruments and playing. So it doesn't really get into theory. We don't really get into notes and intervals or the concepts behind what you're playing. It's more just to play so that your, your hands get in the, the, uh, the practice. And then the music theory course is really where theory comes into play. So, 
hopefully that answers your question if that's what you mean the music theory course and the other playlists totally geek out into theory in great detail um iggy you said uh okay yeah you're answering dave's question um haven't gotten my major award <laughs> he's doing very cool so um okay many vibes you said uh why are double stops called stops pray tell um i'll need to that's a good question and i'll need to give you a good answer uh the next time we meet um okay so yeah music can be difficult to understand amar um thanks for being here uh and certainly when i'm going at a relatively quick pace through these geometries if you're referring to the geometries uh it can maybe seem more complicated than it really is. Um, but once you see that they're consistent across all 12 keys and that it's pre predictable patterns, uh, the difficulty melts away. But what I'm talking about is like starting at, like if you jumped into a movie at the, the hour mark, like in terms of the, the movie or the story of music theory, like I'm not explaining what some of these intervals are that are explained in other videos. So, um, if it seems difficult, there are some earlier explanations of some of these fundamentals that we're just kind of taking for granted in this conversation. Um, uh, let's see. Grateful Bread, I like your name. Uh, if you hit share and copy the link, it helps the channel. Very cool. Um, thank you for being here and I, I love to get your feedback. Um, all right, so last couple of comments here and then we're gonna wrap it up. Um, Let's see, uh, Lucid, this channel is the best. It's also philosophical. It's very cool uh, at its very root, pardon me. Um, it is the expression of truth and beauty formed into instructions uh, we can uh, that we can each play together. I love it. Um, thank you for your feedback. And yeah, like I, I love, if you've ever seen Carl Sagan's Cosmos, one of the things that I love about this, the opening scene of that is that he's not just talking about planets or, or rocks in space. Like he has this like, poetic look at like a dandelion floating in the air and it's it's it captures the beauty it actually literally gives me chills the beauty of how the interconnection between all of these things um so yeah music if you're just you know you just want to like play a few power chords on the guitar um then you're missing out in my opinion because there's a lot to it um, okay, so last comment here. So Alapico, the geometry of the polygons gives each line thereof a particular flavor, correct? Adding a connecting line of whatever polygon adds the two flavors, which becomes the flavor of the resultant chord. Damn, you summarized it so well. Um, I think that's a good place to wrap it up because that was <laughs> that was very well said. Um, it, it's an overlay. Uh, I'm not even gonna try to, to expound upon that because that was beautiful. So thank you for joining this live stream. As always, it's fun to talk through this stuff. Uh, looking forward to connecting with you next week and I will see you real soon. Have a good one.